Good morning, everyone. I am back to read more case studies of Milton H. Erickson, the psychiatrist, from this book again. My voice will go with you. It's full of interesting case studies that are uh, helpful for therapists, for psychology students who are headed into counseling or psych psychology. So this one, the first story is called Blank Paper. And it'll be, uh, it'll just illustrate how Milton Erickson operated. He was, he was known for his hypnosis, but he didn't really um, act like a hypnotherapist. He was just, he just knew from his own life, living and healing his own polio, or at least uh, reversing it enough, if that's the correct word, so that he could function. So here's blank paper. Significant therapy can often be done very, very simply, even though the therapeutic task looks to be huge. One year, a new dean took his place at the medical school. He called me into his office and said, I'm the new dean. I brought with me a protege of mine. Now, now this protege of mine is an absolute gem because he's the most brilliant student I've ever encountered. He's gifted in pathology. He understands pathology and is very interested in slides, but he hates all psychiatrists. And he has a very sharp tongue. He will insult you from all directions. He'll take every chance he can to annoy you. The dean said, Erickson said, don't worry, Dean, I'll handle him. The Dean said, well, you will be the first ever to handle him. And so the first day I introduced myself and told the class I was not like other medical school professors. Other medical school professors thought their, their course was the most important course given in medical school, but I was quite different. I didn't think any such nonsense. It just happened that I knew my course was the most important. That was taken by, in by the class very nicely. And then I said, for those only mildly interested in psychiatry, I offer a list of about 40 extracurricular references for them to read. And for those that have some considerable interest in psychiatry, I offer a list of about 50 references they can read. And for those who are really interested, I offer a list of about 60 outside reading topics. Then I told the whole class to write a review of a certain syllabus on psychiatry and hand it in, hand in the reviews next Monday. Next Monday, that student who hated psychiatry stood in line. Each student passed in his review. That student handed me a blank sheet of paper. I said, without reading your review, I noticed you made two mistakes. You haven't dated it and you haven't signed it. So turn it in next Monday, and remember a, a book review is like reading pathology slides. I got one of the most competent book reviews I've ever had in my life. And the dean said, how on earth did you make a Christian out of that hellion? I took him completely by surprise. The commentary by Rossi, the psychiatrist who wrote this book, it says this, Erickson might have seen the blank paper as an attempt to insult him, and he always pointed out, never take an insult. However, by refusing to see the student's behavior as an insult, Erickson took him by surprise. By pointing out two mistakes, he maintained his position of authority. And by directing the student to look for similarities between a book review and reading pathology slides, he applied some basic teaching principles, initiating motivation and connecting new learnings with older ones. By keeping up the pretense that the blank page was an actual book review, Erickson was also demonstrating the join the patient principle. We see this applied very literally in the next tale. called Ruth. At Worcester Hospital, the superintendent remarked one day, I wish somebody 
could find some way of handling Ruth. I inquired about Ruth, a very pretty, petite 12-year-old girl, very winning in her ways. You wouldn't help liking her. She was so nice in her behavior. And all the nurses warned every new nurse who came to work there, keep away from Ruth. She'll tear your dress, break your arm or your foot. The new nurses didn't believe that of a sweet, winsome 12-year-old Ruth. And Ruth would be beg the new nurse, oh, would you please bring me an ice cream cone and some candy from the store? The nurse would do it, and Ruth would accept the candy and thank the nurse very sweetly. And with a single karate chop break the nurse's arm, or rip her dress off, or kick her in the shins, or jump on her foot. Standard routine behavior for Ruth. Ruth enjoyed it. She also liked to tear the plaster off the walls periodically. I told the superintendent I had an idea and asked if I could handle the case. He listened to my ideas and said, I think that will work. And I know just the nurse who will be glad to help you. One day I got a call. Ruth is on a binge again. I went to the ward. Ruth had torn the plaster off the walls. I tore off the bedclothes. I helped her destroy the bed. I helped her break windows. I had spoken to the hospital engineer before going to the ward. It was cold weather. Then I suggested, Ruth, let's pull that steam register away from the wall and twist off the pipe. That was the heater. I don't know if you recognize that language from early 1900s. And so I sat down on the floor and we tugged away. We broke the register off the pipe. I looked around the room and said, there's nothing more we can do here. Let's go to another room. And Ruth said, are you sure you ought to do this, Dr. Erickson? I said, sure, it's fun, isn't it? I think it is. As we walked down the corridor to another room, there was a nurse standing in the corridor. As we, as we came abreast of her, I stepped over and ripped her uniform and her slip off so she stood in her panties and bra. And Ruth said, Dr. Erickson, you shouldn't do a thing like that. She rushed into the room and got the torn bed sheets and wrapped them around the nurse. She was a good girl after that. I really, I really showed her what her behavior was like. Of course, the nurse was, was an unexperienced nurse and she enjoyed the episode as much as I did. All the nurses were horrified. All the rest of the staff was horrified at my behavior. Only the superintendent and I agreed that my behavior was right. Ruth got even, even with me by escaping from the hospital, getting pregnant, delivering the child, putting it up for adoption. Then she voluntarily came back to the hospital and was a very good patient. A couple of years later, she asked to be discharged, went to work, went to work for, as a waitress, met a young man, married him, became pregnant. To my knowledge, that marriage was happy, long enough for two children to be born. Ruth was a good mother and a good citizen. Often, a patient can be shocked out of their wrong behavior. That's true for anybody. Last one is called Salam. S-A-L-A-A-M. The first year I was on the faculty at Wayne State Medical School, two particular things happened. In my class, there was a girl who had been, taken, had been late to every class in high school. She was called up by teachers and always promised prettily that she would be on time next time. And she apologized so sincerely. She was late to every class in high school and she was a straight A student. She was also so apologetic, so full of believable promises. She was late for every class in college, bawled out every instructor and every professor. She, was, she always apologized prettily and sincerely and always promised to do better in the future and kept on being late. She was a straight A student in college. Then she went to medical school and she was late to every class to every lecture, to every lab. So her fellow students cussed her out for being late, for holding them up in lab work. And she went her merry way, apologizing and promising. 
Now, someone on the faculty of the medical school who knew me said when they found out I was appointed to the faculty, wait till she hits Erickson's class. There will be a terrific explosion. It will be heard the world around. On my first day, I arrived at 7.30 for my eight o'clock lecture and all the class was waiting, including Anne, the tardy one. So at eight, we all filed into the auditorium, except Anne. Each side of the auditorium had an aisle. There was an aisle at the back of the room. There was an aisle on the west side. The students were not listening to my lecture. They were looking at the door. I lectured undisturbed. And when the door opened, very gently and softly and slowly, in walked Anne, 20 minutes late. All the students made a quick jerk with their heads and looked at me. They saw me gesture for them to stand, and they all understood my language. I salamed to Anne as she salamed, salamed to Anne as she walked from the door across the front of the room, down across the back of the room, halfway up the other side, and then took her seat, a seat on the middle aisle. And all the class silently salamed. This is a word I don't know. I, did, I should have looked it up. All the class silently salamed her all the way. At the end of the class, there was a wild rush to get outside. Ann and I were the last to leave the auditorium. I was talking about Detroit weather or some subject like that. And we walked down the corridor. A janitor silently salamed her. Some undergraduate students came down the corridor and silently salamed her. The dean stepped out of the office and salamed her. His secretary came out and salamed her. All day long. Long, poor Anne got salam silently. She was first. She was the first student in the class the next day, and thereafter she had withstood Dean's rebukes, rebukes from all the professors, but silent salaming she could not take. Whereas other teachers had tried to change Anne's behavior by disciplining her, Eric's approach, Erickson's approach was to congratulate her on her power. Salaming was a way of showing obeisance. He made it clear to her that she was using her power in a reverse way. When she could understand this, we could determine how she was going to use her power constructively. Other people had tried to control her by verbal means and she proved that she could not be verbally controlled. Erickson used a nonverbal approach, which led her to realize that she was using her control in a self-hurting way. She could direct her controlling tendencies in a more constructive way. As in all cases, the power to change resided in her. Erickson set up a situation in which change could happen. Erickson's attitude indicated his belief that he could deal incisively with whatever situation arose. If the situation called for confrontation, he knew that he could do that. If it called for kindness, he could be kind. If it called for sharpness, he knew that he could be sharp. The subliminal message Erickson is giving us is that he had confidence in his ability to handle situations. We are free to identify with this feeling ourselves and to be more assertive. So that one I've read several times, years past, and was somewhat familiar with it, but I did not remember what Salon meant. So it's education for you and I. Thank you for listening and I will see you on the next one, or you'll see me, and it'll be fun. Thanks.